Hello, everybody. Welcome to our special. I've lost you, Liam. <laughs> so while Liam's connecting back in, so welcome everyone to today's talk. Um, I'll introduce myself while Liam's logging. Oh, there he is. Sorry about that, everyone. I was just about to say happy Valentine's Day to Australia's diabetes community and uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, special Take Diabetes to Heart Facebook Live uh, Q&A. Um, before we begin and go through some of the pleasantries though, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. Uh, diabetes Australia acknowledges Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of this country. We recognise their connection to land, waters, winds and culture. We pay the utmost respect to them, their cultures, and to elders past and present. We extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. We recognise that Australia is made up of hundreds of different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups, each with their own histories, culture, language, and belief systems. Their relationship with country remains of utmost importance as it is the foundation for culture, family, and kinships, songlines, and languages. Diabetes Australia is committed to improving health outcomes for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people affected by diabetes and those at risk. Um, I'd just like to start by introducing myself. I'm Liam Fernie. This is the first time I've posted a Facebook Live, uh, probably hence the technical glitch we saw just at the beginning. <laughs> um, I've worked for Diabetes Australia now for, or in Diabetes Queensland before that for about 10 years. I don't live with diabetes, but I spend a lot of time uh, talking uh, with and advocating for people who live with diabetes. Uh, my day job here at Diabetes Australia is National Corporate Affairs Manager, uh, and I look after our uh, media relations, our policy, our advocacy. Um, so most of my days are, are dedicated towards fighting to ensure people with diabetes get access to the support and care they need. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of words about uh, our former and uh, much loved Facebook Live host, uh, Renza Shabilia. Um, Renza's recently accepted a, a role uh, with JDRF International as Director of Community Building wow. and Communication Global Access. I spoke to Renza just before this uh, Facebook Live and she's, she's very excited about the new role. Um, we'll certainly be continuing to um, stay in touch with Renza. She is a, a wonderful source of information um, and passion for uh, people living with diabetes. Um, and, you know, I'd just like to use this, this public forum to say thank you to Renza for all of her hard work, um, supporting both people with diabetes and supporting staff at Diabetes Australia so we can support people living with diabetes. Um, our guest today is, uh, to be no strangers to frequent viewers of this program, uh, Associate Professor Ralph Alderham is a general practice practitioner who's worked for over 25 years in general practice. He has a long-standing interest in the management of chronic conditions and general practice, especially diabetes and heart disease. He enjoys teaching medical students, GP registrars, and general practitioners. Thank yeah, you. and look, believe it now, it's over 30 years, so getting a bit long in the tooth. Uh, with, uh, with, with age comes wisdom. <laughs> um, and are you doing anything special for Valentine's Day? Uh, I'm doing a, a special FaceTime broadcast for DA, so, <laughs> and we're going to talk about heart of all things. So, can can, we, can you start by explaining why people living with diabetes are at a, a greater risk of heart disease? Well, gosh, now the why is, you know, a really tough one to answer, but we certainly do know that people with diabetes are certainly at higher risk. Interestingly enough, we used to concentrate predominantly on people with type 2 diabetes, but there's now a larger recognition that people with type 1 diabetes are also at a much higher risk. And traditionally, the intervention for people with type 1 diabetes has occurred much later. We're starting to see a trend now that, in fact, we do need to intervene people with uh, type 1 much earlier. Um, and in fact, if you look at our risk calculators, so... At the moment, uh, it only says diabetes, yes and no. 
If you look at some of the risk calculators overseas, like Pure Risk, they actually specifically give you a risk if you have type 1 and type 2. So it's a little bit more nuanced. We will be getting a new cardiovascular risk calculator in Australia sometime in the middle of this year. And that too will be separating out people who have type 1 versus type 2. So, you know, anyone will be able to log on and actually work out what their risk is. So do we know why there's a, a different level of, uh, of risk for people living with type 1 and type 2 diabetes? I mean, they're, they're two completely different diseases. You know, it's interesting. We call them diabetes, but they are completely different. So in people with type 2, we know it's... Uh, more of a cardiometabolic thing. So we know it has a lot to do with insulin resistance. We know it has a lot to do with, you know, blood pressure and so on. So, um, and in fact, many people would say uh, type 2 diabetes is in fact not a, a, a disease of insulin or glucose, but in fact, a cardiovascular disease. Because, you know, uh, most people with type 2 will die of heart disease, not of a complication from diabetes. Type 1 is a little bit different. You know, basically, pancreas not working, no insulin, bang. Um, so they don't have the insulin resistance. But the cumulative effect of having higher blood glucose does have an impact, uh, impact on our blood vessels. And so that's where their risk starts to come in. But it's happening much earlier than we thought. So what are, what are some of the, the steps um, people can take to reduce their risk of heart disease or to just generally look after their heart? Well, uh, great question. We could, we could talk about this forever. Um, but, you know, the, the main issues are know your risk. You know, if, if you know you're at high risk, there are things that you can do to reduce that risk. And so there are things called heart health checks that you can go along to your GP and have a heart health check. And basically they sit down, they do your blood pressure, they do your weight, they check your cholesterol. And at the end of it, they'll say, your risk of having a heart attack in the next five years is, and then depending on what that is, I'll say, look, go away. Uh, you're doing very well. We'll do this again in two years or so. Or they'll say, you're at high risk. Actually, we need to do something now. And the important thing there is that people with heart disease often don't know it's actually happening to them until something major happens. And we know that at least, you know, um, well, we do know people who are at high risk aren't being treated. And so we need people to actually go and ask for that heart health check so they can work out if they're high risk and then they can get the treatment that they need. Are there any uh, symptoms people should be on the lookout? Yeah, look, by the time you're getting symptoms, you've already missed the boat from my point of view. So, you know, it's like in people with type 2 diabetes, if we can catch people in the pre-diabetes stage, we can often stop them going on. But, of course, there's no symptoms. And that's the same message I want to get across with heart disease. If we catch people before they get symptoms, we can prevent the heartache. Sorry about the pun, but we, we can prevent that that heart attack. Now, some of the symptoms that are war, you know, warning signs would be chest pain, but especially when you're doing some sort of an activity. So exertional chest pain is always a big concern. The problem when you have diabetes is you often don't feel the pain to the same degree. And so it doesn't have to be specifically bad pain. But if you get chest pains when you're doing activity and when you stop, it goes away, that is angina or heart problems until you've proven otherwise. Some of the other ones may be when you're exercising, you get puffed, much more puffed than you think you should. You know, So that could be the fact there's not enough sort of circulation going to the heart. But again, what I'd like to stress is if we can get people nice and early and manage their risks, I, I think that's a really important uh, message to get out there before you get symptoms. And while I've got that, if you do have chest pain, you wake up in the middle of the night, you've got chest pain, hasn't gone within a few minutes, phone the ambulance. I am still surprised at how many people say, oh, it wasn't that bad. 
and I didn't want to disturb the ambulance people. You know, it was the middle of the night. No. Ambulance people would much rather people call. They'll come out. They'll look at you. They'll do a tracing. If they think it's nothing to do with the heart, they'll tell you to see your GP the next day. But if it's a heart, if they get you into a hospital within an hour, they can reverse the whole thing. So do not delay phoning an ambulance if you have chest pain. So you hear that, viewers? That I think is a very important takeaway from, uh, from Dr. Ralph is that if you have chest pain, phone an ambulance. So just to, to go back to what you were saying in terms of getting checked before uh, symptoms developed, basically the best time to act is, is when nothing is wrong. Yeah, and so we can, we can pick out who's at high risk. Um, if you go on the current website, cvdcheck.org.au, it will give you, um, you know, a simple risk calculator. But if you look at those people who are automatically at high risk, and, you know, this is going to surprise some of your viewers, but people who have type 2 diabetes over 60 years of age is already considered to be at high risk. So if you've got type 2 diabetes over 60, you should be on treatment to prevent heart disease. Um, and... I guess how often should people be checked for for heart disease? I mean, if you're if you're say under sixty, is it is it less frequently? Is it um, the same? What when should we be? How often should we be talking to our GP about this? So yeah, look, I mean, it's a great question because you know I don't think anyone has an answer, you know, specifically. But certainly having an annual review, you know, talking to your doctor, how's my cholesterol going? How's the, the diabetes going? What's my blood pressure like? Because one of the things here is that those people are at high risk. Most actually don't get treated to where they should be. And look, I can understand, you know, the doctor says, oh, well, I'm going to give you another tablet. And I can hear all the people with type 2 saying, oh, God, not another tablet. But this is really important. So... You know, there's a study done from Queensland, you know, your home state, that actually showed that the vast majority of people at high risk aren't treated appropriately and they're overrepresented in people going to hospital. If we grab that group and put them on, yes, a cholesterol tablet, get their blood pressure right down, you know, increase their activity, you know, help them sort of you know, move to that Mediterranean diet, we can prevent that heart attack from happening. And so you, you, you've mentioned blood pressure and, and cholesterol a couple of times. What can what what make what what could make a person's blood pressure high? And how can we how can we keep it low? Yeah, look, the most common cause or reason why people have blood pressure is what we call essential. So it's basically part of your genetic makeup. But there are things that are really important around this. So, you know, you've heard of low salt. So everyone knows that salt, having a low salt diet can have a, a really big impact for blood pressure for some people. Keeping yourself physically fit. And by that, I mean, yes, we do our normal walks or whatever, but two or three days a week, you know, getting a little bit of huff and puff going where you're working that little bit harder, that's really important. I do believe stress management has a key role here. So learning how to tune out, how to, you know, if you're into meditation, Tai Chi, things like that, I think have a really important role. Um, and of course, diet, um, you know, you've heard me mention the Mediterranean diet, but, you know, if we can go more to that, you know, less processed food, you know, more Mediterranean style, it does make such a big difference. And in fact, um, there is evidence around, the Mediterranean diet decreasing the risk of heart attacks and decreasing the risk of dying. So it's actually not a bad diet to be on. And what sorts of what sorts of foods foods are included on the Mediterranean diet? Yeah, look, I mean, there's some great resources around if you Google the Mediterranean diet. But essentially, it's you know two days we have uh, red meat or chicken, two days a week we have fish, and then the rest of it is actually vegetarian with lots of legumes and pulses. And then you have, you know, nuts throughout, you're using olive oil, you know, so it's that sort of an approach. Um, and that's been shown to improve the pattern of your cholesterol. 
Um, but, you know, there is a, a strong genetic component to things like cholesterol as well. And this is where it's important to have regular checks. Try the diet if you keto and, and see if it has an impact. But there will be a group of people who the diet, in fact, may help a little bit, but not a lot. And for those people, if they're at high risk, they need to be on medication. Um, and just just a quickly a word to our, our community. Um, we, we do have Dr. Ralph here to answer all your questions uh, about heart health and living with diabetes. So please uh, don't be shy, leave them in the chat um, and we'll, we'll make sure to ask them. Um, we've talked about uh, being physically active. We've talked about um, making healthy food choices. So I've got a note here to uh, one, one of the things to do to um, look after your heart is to keep uh, cho cholesterol and triglycerides in the target range. How do people achieve that? Okay, so again, the target depends on where you are and what your risk is. So if you're at high risk or you've had an event, you know, your target, and we often talk about LDL because that's the bad cholesterol. You often want your LDL to be 1.8 or less. To get there, most people would need medication. And there's no doubt that if you've had an event or you're at high risk, medication, and I'm talking specifically about statins, statins make a huge difference and will, um, you know, save you or prevent a, either a second heart attack from happening or prevent the first one. About 10% of people can't tolerate statins. And so there are now a whole other range of medications that can be used. And there are some new ones coming in that, you know, that we can prescribe that do amazing work. But, you know, to get down to that 1.8, most people would require some sort of medication. And how does a, how does a statin function? Okay, so basically, you know, they work through the liver um, and they uh, basically decrease um, your LDL. Um, and, you know, we talk about varying strengths of statin. So there's a whole variety out of them. And we often talk about high potency ones, which will be your atorvastatin and resuvastatin. They're the ones that have the biggest bang for buck. Um, and they will reduce your LDL. And you'll often hear me talk about LDL because that's the one that's been associated with heart disease. Now, we are getting... I suppose, smarter about this. They are breaking LDLs and your cholesterol down to some other subfractions. We're still trying to work out how we're going to manage that going forward. Um, but certainly LDL as an indicator. Um, and the other one is what they call the non-HDL. So that's taking away the good cholesterol, what's left. Um, and so, you know, all most of your... Um, Cholesterol reports will have that uh, listed now. And what I would want people to know is know your numbers. So know what your cholesterol is, know what your blood pressure is, know what your risk of having a heart attack in the next five or 10 years is. Then you can sit down and work out, oh, that's a little bit on the high side. Maybe I should work with my doctor and talk about medication. That, that, that seems pretty clear. And I think we, we say it again, the best time to get a, get a heart check uh, or make an appointment to get a heart check is probably today. Um, yeah. But you notice I haven't said anything about A1C. No. So A1C, yes, it's important for general health reasons, but it's not as strong a predictor of heart disease as your cholesterol and blood pressure is. So this is where I'm asking people to know I mean, A1C, you know, people with diabetes often know and, and work out, but the cholesterol and your blood pressure numbers, really important to know. So you, you could be doing well on your HbA1c, but the important thing is that you, you uh, may not be out of the woods. Um, no, absolutely. So it's interesting. All the intervention trials around reducing A1c has only a little impact on your risk of having a heart attack, but dropping your cholesterol and blood pressure has a huge impact. And so that's where the focus needs to be. And often, you know, we, we, we got lost, you know, we, we got focused on the A1C more than some of those other measures. But I think the, the tide's turning a bit now. Um, and 
is heart health, I mean, you, you hear stories and things about um, people suffering massive heart attacks and things in their, their, their 40s and 50s. And that, that, if I'm not incorrect, that was more common, um, you know, a couple of decades ago. And we've actually made some, some big improvements around heart health in, in recent decades. Is that? Well, yeah, look, I, I mean, the incidence of heart disease has been progressively getting less. Uh, the impact of um, hasn't has as much an impact on people with type two diabetes. Our, our treatment of heart disease has really improved over the last three decades. And so the message here is that if we can get to people within an hour of a heart attack, we can reverse it. Yeah. And that's, that's the key message. No matter where you are, if you can get to a doctor within an hour and start the treatment, you can reverse what's happening. And I'm sure everyone's heard about stents and they also can give, if you're out rural, they can give you something to dissolve the clot. But, you know, you've got to get onto it early. None of this, I'll, I'll wait and see what it's like the next day. I mean, I've had people who have had chest pains, you know, over the weekend, but oh, I didn't want to trouble anyone. So they rock up on the Monday and you know, say, well, oh, and you do an ECG. They've had a heart attack, and I can see it's been a while. We've missed the boat. I can't reverse that. So they've now got a scar on their heart that will be there forever. Fair enough. So, again, the message, people, is to uh, if you think you're having a heart attack or if you've got vague concerns, you are, call the ambulance straight away. Absolutely. That's really important. And the ambulance people don't mind being called out because they will check. And if you've got it, they'll think, fantastic. If you haven't or you're not having a heart attack, they'll say, glad you called, but no, you can wait till you see your GP tomorrow. Yeah, and that seems like a like a better approach. You can you can act up front and you don't have anything to regret. Um, we often hear about um, you know, different sorts of foods that may have healthy fats or good fats, or you know, are there any particular foods um within sort of say a, the Mediterranean, like actual foods that are good for heart health? Look, I, I think the whole Mediterranean process has been shown to to be really effective for this. And, it, you know, the, the fish, the oily fish, certainly do have a, a nice impact on your cholesterol. Having that unprocessed food and, of course, you know, often the Mediterranean diet is has a low GI, so it's often really good in managing some of your postprandial sort of excursions. Um, but, you know, diet... You know, there's a difference between someone whose cholesterol is up a little bit and then go on a diet. But again, you know, if you look at our current calculator, there's no listing of family history. And so, you know, I freak out if I've got someone sitting in front of me, 45, comes in for a heart health check and he says, oh, yes, my uncle died of a heart attack at 55. My dad had a heart attack 60. And I'm sitting there saying, well, that's high risk. That I don't care. That you know, there's something going on within the genes, and so starting from that point, looking at his cholesterol and blood pressure, and treating, make sure that his blood pressure and cholesterol are really good, you know, nice and low, and getting onto that diet and exercise really quickly becomes important. And my threshold for prescribing is much lower. So that's what we call the fiddle factor, because at the moment it's not in the calculator. The new one that's coming will have all those elements in it. Which, um, which gets to an interesting question. What sort of information should you have prepared when you when you go to the GP for your heart health check? What questions yeah, look, should you be ready to answer? Look, certainly if you can have your blood tests beforehand, and so with the blood test cholesterol, you know, your A1C, and if you don't have diabetes, you know, whether you have prediabetes or not, a check on the kidneys. We know that as your kidney function goes down, um, your risk of heart disease goes up. So having a kidney check as well. And for certainly we know that if, you know, how diabetes can sometimes affect the kidney and we, we screen for that by looking for protein or microalbuminuria or microalbumin in the urine. If you have that, that microalbumin, your risk of having a heart attack is really high. So again, if you look at the cardiovascular risk calculator, and say, who is at high risk? It says anyone with diabetes 
who have microalbumin in the urine. So again, that's, uh, and so you need to be treated and treated aggressively. And you may say, but my cholesterol's not that bad. Doesn't matter. The kidney has undone all of that and you need to be treated aggressively. So I know it sounds very complex, but at the end of the day, you know, if you look at those high risk people and people with type two diabetes are at high risk, um, you get to know who needs to be on what and when. And we certainly understand um, at Diabetes Australia, and we hear from people, um, and we see it in the data, that um, following up your annual cycle of care, doing all of these, these health checks um, is a real time impost, is a, is a real uh, burden. In my my day-to-day -day job, when I'm not on the screen with you, Ralph, I'm, one of the things we've been thinking about a lot is uh, diabetes kidney disease screening program because um, not enough people with, living with diabetes are getting uh, kidneys screened within the timeframes. And, you know, one of the reasons is that people don't have the time to do that. And we're looking at ways to make that easier. But I think that's a, it's a good time to remind people, get your kidneys checked. Um, it, um, you know, most kidney so, damage is reversible. Yeah, so, so where I come from this is, look, I'm a big believer is that if people with diabetes know what they need, and they are, and look, if you go to any GP, say, look, I think I'm due for my heart health check, I need my cholesterol and kidney check, they will do it. Sometimes if we don't have a system in place, we'll sometimes forget to remind people. But this is where if you as a person living with diabetes, if you actually say, look, my cholesterol was up last time and that was six months ago, I've made some changes, go in and say, look, I'd love to have another test. I know it's a timing cost, but you know, if we get it wrong and you end up having a heart attack, you know, you'll be thinking, should have done this earlier, should have got on top of it. And really know your numbers, you know, so get that, you know, if your blood pressure is always a little bit on the higher side, not quite a target, don't be afraid to say, I want an increased medication. Um, I know it's, I know people used to hate me saying that, but in the long run, it will prevent problems like heart disease and strokes. And so we know if we get in early, it makes a big difference. Um, probably a, another thing here on my list is, um, and this probably doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, but uh, obviously smoking is a major risk factor. Absolutely. So if you, you know, what you can do with the risk calculators is you can muck around with different cholesterols, whether you have diabetes or not, and whether you smoke or not. And every time, you know, I love showing people if they stop smoking, the risk will usually drop by about half. So it's the single most effective treatment that you can do to prevent a heart attack from coming on. And look, in this day and age, there are lots of things that we can do to help people give up cigarettes. I mean, it's not easy and people have to take quite a few goes before they get there. But the message here is never quit being a quitter. I mean, I, I think that's a great motto from the Quit Foundation, um, and it has such a huge impact. Yeah, no, that's 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 some very good advice. Look, I think that's um, almost all we have we have time for today. Um, did you have any anything else uh, for our audience? Yeah, look, I look, I I I'm, I'm firmly believe in that people with diabetes should be taking the lead role. Um, and, you know, you should know your numbers, know your risk. Um, and, you know, I often get people to, you know, have a high blood pressure machine uh, just so that they can check it themselves, you know, work out their own pattern of when they want to have their cholesterol done because at the end of the day, it's about you. And if we get that right, you know, and let me say, People with diabetes are their own best advocates. If you know you're at risk and you need things done, remind the GP because sometimes we do forget. And it, it won't, you know, you won't insult us or anything like that. And let me say, we love it when people, well, I won't say we, I love it when people come in with things like lists and printouts from the web because I know I've got someone who is interested in their own health. And if you have an interest in your own health, you will do far, far better than someone who knows nothing about their health. So that self-management is really key. And I know DA is running out a program called Desmond. 
So Desmond's all about learning about diabetes and how it impacts upon you. And so if you've not done something like a Desmond program, you should have a, a chat to your local diabetes organization because there's actually some really good evidence around that if you do Desmond, you actually end up being a lot better off. We can we can uh, post some uh, some links in the in the in the chat about Desmond. I think that's that's some excellent advice. Um, today's uh, Facebook Live Q and A is um, is part of our Take Diabetes to Heart campaign. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. One of the things we want people to do is 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 take um, diabetes to heart, and that's not just people living with diabetes, but the people who love people living with diabetes. Mm. So have a loved one today. Um, about you know the importance of their heart health. Um, if you've got, if you're living with diabetes, make an appointment today to talk to your GP um, about what you can do to lower your risk to and and to get your heart health check and to to know your numbers. And um, you know take take the opportunity to um, try and incorporate more physical activity in your life and to make healthy food choices. You can find some uh, healthy advice uh, for living well. Looking after your heart at Take Diabetes Two, the number two, heart.com.au. Um, thank you very much for giving up your time and joining us today, Ralph. Look, I've always loved uh, supporting DA. They've done such a great job in advocating for people with diabetes, and uh, we do need the voice of people with diabetes out there to make a difference. Thank you so much, Ralph. And Nalin, before you take us out, everybody, um, only positive reviews for my first performance, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Melinda.